Keith is here. Hi, Keith. Hey, we have Keith. All right. So now I guess we call the meeting to order at uh, 6.04. All right, this is, this is definitely a brave new world for me. Um, so this is the public hearing of the proposed uh, fiscal year 21 budget. And uh, of course, uh, it's public, but it's online. So uh, it, it looks like we have plenty of people uh, in addition to the, the people who are directly involved in the meeting, which is uh, always a good thing. Um, let's get started. Uh, can we get a uh, motion to approve the minutes? February 4th? I approve the minutes as written. Outstanding. I'll second. All in favor? Uh, aye. Aye. Outstanding. All right. All right for me. Um, how's uh, how's the signing of the financial warrants going to work? So just to pull you, can I pull you back, Greg? So basically, when you do the, we're doing the public hearing. We'll do the hearing first. And then we'll talk about, then we'll go into the regular business of the meeting directly following. So the first thing I, we kind of, even approving the minutes, we skip the, the portion of the budget. So basically you want to do the public hearing. So having, I recommend having Shelly kind of do an overview of the, the last version of the budget. And then it's the time for the public to weigh in if they want to. And then we'll go into the financial warrants and then all the, the business of the school committee that afterwards. Does that make so sense? Sounds just right to me. All right. It's just, yeah, it's the it's the confusing thing, especially this way where we didn't. All right. So, Shelly. Okay, great. Um, so, I'm going to share my screen. That way I can um, display the narrative that we're working on. Everyone see my screen? It's coming up now. Okay. <clears throat> Did it come up, Darius? Yep. Okay. Um, so this gives a general overview of the budget that we had created. Obviously, this is prior to any school closure, um, and there may be some things that we need to talk about beyond this, but right now this is where the FY21 budget stands. Um, so we are looking at an increase of 4.9% or $145,000 for a total town appropriation of $3,099,659. We made adjustments for expenditures based on actuals from the prior three fiscal years, as well as taking input from administrators and principal in regards to operational and programmatic needs. Uh, we did include wage increases for staff across the board, so instructional assistants and teachers, as well as non-union personnel, including central office, custodians, secretaries, principals, et cetera. Um, the budget also includes the addition of one new full-time teacher uh, team leader position. Uh, we also had to add in expenditures that were omitted from the FY20 budget in error. Uh, this totaled $7,000, so these have been absorbed back into FY21, into the general fund. Um, and for those of you that do have the complete budget, I, I know not everybody has that in front of them, but it, there is a line by line in the complete budget, and there are some minor increases in certain areas of operations. However, very few changes were made outside of salaries and wages, um, and I'm going to go ahead and talk about all of those now. Um, so the next two line items here, the school committee legal expense, that was omitted in error in FY20. Um, that has to be added back in. And then we had a change in our trash vendor this year, and that required us to absorb $5,000 back into the budget. We have the new keyless entry key fob system at the school. And while it is a brand new system, and that was fully funded by a grant moving forward, we will need to carry some costs to cover any potential maintenance that could come up. We also increased our summer custodial support and, and building repairs based on needs. So the total of these categories, which were the largest increases, um, is less than $15,000 of the 145 that we're looking to increase. 
The remainder of the increase was from salaries and wages. So we have earmarked a uh, cost of living adjustment that is for a potential contract negotiation settlement, as well as column and step movement for our teachers next year. That would total 79,000 based on what we have in there for a placeholder at the moment. Our IA wages are based on their contract settlement for a $21,000 increase, and that includes the cost of living and the step movement. We had um, a speech and uh, physical therapist staff both being paid out of our special education revolving funds. Uh, that account uh, has seen a decrease in revenue over the past several years. And based on what we have for tuition coming in in that program next year, we, it required a reduction in the salaries and wages that were on that SPED revolving fund. So we've moved off 45,000 onto the general funds as that account can no longer continue to support um, all of the salaries and wages. And then as mentioned previously, uh, we have the addition of one full-time team leader position. Uh, that is an increase of roughly $55,000. That's where we're anticipating this position would be hired at. Um, I would okay. let, ask Ben to speak to that further if there are questions, but it is in support of um, the special needs of the students and in support of the staff at the school. And then we have a wage increase of $7,700 anticipated for non-union personnel, um, which includes anyone in central law, administration, um, principals, custodians, et cetera, secretaries. Um, and then we also have a decrease that's to be noted. So a lot of these expenses have to have something to offset it. Um, it's really just moving funds around at this point. It's not a reduction in the number of IAs. We just changed the funding source for two IAs totaling $40,000 moving that money onto school choice. Um, so addition to the general fund, uh, Sunderland Elementary will use revolving and grant funds to fully fund the school's total operating budget of $3,648,494. Uh, those other revolving funds include school choice, uh, special education revolving, school lunch revolving, um, grants, and early childhood revolving and any other small revenue sources that we can capture throughout the year. I know that was a lot of information and I talk a little bit fast, so I'm certainly happy to review again or take any questions. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing, but can go back to sharing if something is, is needed to be looked at again. I think, do you want me to keep saying what I'm yeah. thinking or you want to jump in, Greg? I was, say, I was going to open it up, but uh, why, don't, why don't you uh, jump in? My only, uh, my, my, the statement is the, so basically the elephant in the room is that the the, the select board finance committee um, sent us a note, sent all departments a note to um, plan for a three to 5% um, decreases in their budgets um, as presented as, as they have them. Um, right now, um, I really want the committee to understand what the current needs are. Um, and kind of have in the public have the understanding of what we where we at with the our budget narrative here. I'm and I'm not in really wanting to go through and and theorize what a five percent cut is. Um, you know, we can start talking about. And I know people might want to dive in, maybe want to dive into certain portions of this. The problem is we don't really know if it's a five percent decrease. That was a very conservative. Uh, may not vary. I don't know. You know, we're in the we're living in the midst of a crisis. Um, the, fin the finance of the state is going to be um, hit um, through the lack of revenues from taxes, um, through the closed businesses and such, from excise taxes that the towns run off of. And so there's a whole funding area that's going to be going to be hit. The question then comes in is what's going to happen with federal funding? What's going to happen with the rainy day billions that we have kind of in savings in Massachusetts? How will they be applied? And then how will the state then go and fund towns and education? So and I, and I might go a little bit down the street and so you can put your hand up, Greg, if I go too far. Um, but, you know, Student Opportunity Act is a, um, you know, is, 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 is set on um, appropriated funds. And so, you know, those may not be, they're subject to appropriations, so those may not be coming. Um, and though, although we not, may not be receiving SOA funds, um, Student Opportunity Act, if I use SOA as an acronym, um, that's going to change the funding what happens in urban districts. And before it trickles out to our district, which has not seen a lot of that money, our money, we will not receive any very, we'll see very little money from the federal government. Um, I, I saw it's not, you know, what it says 2 trillion 
It goes to billions by the time it hits Massachusetts. It's going to be distributed through Title I funding, which we receive some, but not a lot. Um, not enough to offset the, the, these, these percentages. Um, so if there is a there is a uh, adjustment to this budget that's going to have to happen. And in in my, my, my kind of uh, suggestions to the committee, it's your budget, um, but is that to understand where these, what things can be moved around and what things can't, there are some negotiables within this budget and some that aren't really negotiables. Um, you know, I'll do something very easy, which we can keep something simple and kind of say with humor, we, you know, the trash expense, um, well, if we're at home, I guess the trash would go away, but we're not gonna be able to burn the trash. So we're gonna have to do, we're gonna have to have that trash expense. So while, you know, they're saying reduce a the budget, there are certain things in our budget moving forward where we can't reduce it because that's how much it costs. Um, we also have contractual obligations that were, that is the cost. Um, so, so I, I you know, that being the open in the room, it is the public hearing on the budget, so the public can comment. Um, but that's kind of the other side that wasn't said as part of Shelley's presentation that I know is on a lot of people's minds. It says, how can you really go forward with a 4.9% increase when we're talking about possibly up to a 5% decrease um, in revenues to, to, the, to the towns? Um, and so we understand that, but I think it's, we gotta get people in a starting spot. Greg? Yeah. Um, so, you explained it well. Uh, we've got some things that are not very flexible. Uh, we have some pay rates that we're locked into. And really, the only degree of freedom left, if you had to, was uh, just headcounts, is basically your expenses are salary. And you have you have to pay people a certain amount of money. So it, it would be very challenging to, uh, to make cuts. And I do also agree that uh, it would be good to know exactly what we should be cutting, what, what the goal would be. Um, I was at the uh, finance committee meeting Friday. I saw uh, uh, Peter was also at the, uh, the select board meeting Monday. Uh, Peter, you asked the same question that I asked, uh, which is we heard that the state revenues were gonna come in maybe 5% low. Uh, does that mean that they're looking for a 5% uh, cut across the board or just 5% of what was coming from the state? Uh, and the town administrator said, yeah, they're basically looking for 5% uh, across the board, which I understand is uh, there's uncertainty and they're looking at lost revenue within the town and lost revenue from the state. Um, but uh, also, we also have to inform the public and them as well okay, if we had to make a certain number work, what would be the impact of the schools? Uh, and it's hard to do that if you've got to like give them a menu. It's easier if, if we hear, here's a specific target that we have to go for. And that's, that's based on um, another point that I'm not sure you made, but is certainly true is information is continuing to roll in. Uh, the, the town meeting and election has been delayed. And there is, we're here to vote a budget. I don't want to keep punting, but uh, we are also in a situation where there's a lot of uncertainty and there may be some more clarity or maybe not coming down that would uh, help us figure out which way to lean on this. Um, I don't know if anyone else on the committee wants to weigh in with something. Uh, Greg, can I add? Um, this is Peter. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just I I talked to Scott Bergeron this afternoon about sort of the status of things, and uh, you know this is very much a an early stage in this whole thing, and and we don't know yet with any uh, any even the slightest degree of certainty how things are going to look, and so I don't think there's any expectation on their part that this evening we're going to do be producing anything in terms of a you know, what a reduced budget might be or so on. It's just uh, to realize that the situation is uh, is very uncertain. And as we get, uh, once we get some firmer indications from the state about what their numbers might be like, uh, then it'll probably be time for, you know, all parts of the town, to, all town departments in the schools to, to, to really start figuring out what we're going to have to do. But I think at this point, it's way too early. And uh, I know that Darius and Shelley and Ben have been thinking about it, but beyond that, I, I think that, you know, 
what we're doing here tonight is um, is really just dealing with the with the budget that, as Darius says, is the budget of what we need, and um, um, you know, move on with the other stuff as it becomes uh, uh, more clear what it is our target is. Well said. And I think just for a procedural, where as people are watching, if in our district we've gotten to the habit of having the public hearing, then after the public hearing, voting the budget to move forward. The only the only uh, committee that has to do that just procedurally is Frontier. Frontier is by law has to let the towns know 45 days before the first town meeting what their budget is moving forward, so the towns can plan appropriately. Um, our budget is more fluid, and even though we've gotten the habit of voting the budget at the end of after the hearing, after getting the final public input, last year we didn't do that, as you remember as well, because we had uh, a lot of budget movement going on as well. So, and the fact that the town the uh, the town meeting has been moved off to Jan uh, to June um, again gives us more time to to wait on those numbers. I think from the state because. When we start talking about those numbers, you're talking about a percentage, if each percentage point, and I'm looking at you, Shelley, you can't tell that my Brady Bunch here of people. Um, I'm looking at you, Shelley, but I believe it's around 30,000 is a percentage point. So one percentage point is a very, it's a, it's a, it's a position or a significant cut. Is that a right number to use, Shelley? I'm just, yes, about 30,000. So I think it's just under. So, um, you know, so we talk about five, you know, 5%, I mean, you're talking about $150,000. Um, you know, four yeah, percent yeah. is a significant difference, and you're in the planning is different too. It's not just how many. It's not a list. I want people to understand from a, an administrative point of view. While we have a list of, you know, we have ideas and and we know where some certain things are and certain ways we want to go, but the list changes depending on what the number is. Because if you have to get to a certain one, you, it's not one, two, three, four, five. It may be one, two, and then if if five is no longer in thing, then we kind of shift or we can, we fund it a different way where we take a different amount of different funds. Um, and um, anyway, so you know, I got also that sidetrack in my mind. Shelly, I wanna make sure we also give the, the committee a chance to talk about um, the fact that we will have less in our revolving accounts going into next year too and the concerns there. I wanna make sure yeah. we don't that as well. Um, so, but it, it came to me in the middle there, so I didn't wanna. No, that's so, okay. So, so anyway, that's just, I just want people to think, think about those, the numbers there that why that way. And that's why it's important. We also get the exact numbers from the town. I don't like just three to 5%. I want, you know, we need to make a goal of this. The school needs to cut, you know, $500. And then we say, oh, how are we going to find $500? And, and I'm very optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I do think that while we don't have a lot of wiggle room in this budget that the majority of our expenses are in salaries some of which are contractual and other ones are not and then those minor increases that we talked about i do think we have some room for movement before we go into looking at any type of staffing cuts you know greg you had originally started talking about you know we're talking about reduction in numbers and you know we certainly yeah. could have to go down that road but the hope is that we wouldn't have to do that. And I do see some areas where we could um, bring that number down, um, not to not to level funding, which is really what they're asking us to do if it's a 5% is to level fund. And um, that's not likely going to be possible. But I do think that we have some other revenue sources. Um, you know, we, we certainly could talk about use of more school choice funds. Um, we will have to talk about some of the things that Darius mentioned. Um, with our other revolving funds, particularly early childhood and what the ripple down effect is going to be from the loss of tuition and early childhood this year to next year. I think that we are um, too far away from knowing where the town needs us to be to go into a lot of those specifics. But I also don't want to frighten anyone that, you know, we're immediately cutting. Um, Thank you for saying that. I, I, I was maybe out of line there. Let, let me put it this no. way. I, I don't know how to get to level funding without doing something drastic. But uh, but if we can agree on a different number, then absolutely, then we'll, we'll see what can be done in the middle. Yeah, and I think it could very well come down to if they really want 5%, I think we will have to make some hard decisions. 
Um, but the goal would be to use every alter alternative way to get to that 5% before we're talking about any reductions in staff. Anyone else on the one way in? Also, make sure we open up public comment if there's anybody yeah, about the to go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just um, so let's see. We have uh, we have people who are maybe on the phone, and then uh, probably a number uh, on computer. I, I guess. Uh, I think the easiest way to be if you're on a computer to jump in and hit chat and just say you have a question or you'd like to make a comment. Um, and if you're on the phone, first let the people on the. We don't have a lot of phone people. In fact, I don't see any phone people. We're all on the computer? They're all on the computer. I don't yeah. see any numbers on my list on the right. So, and I'll take any second expert meet users um, there. But if you have a, would you like to, if you like to make a public comment, just please type in the chat, kind of just say hi, and we'll say, we'll, we'll elect you. We'll give you a minute there to, to jump on. Uh, before we start the public comment, I think that, we only have participants here who have FRSU 38 emails. I got a text from a parent who was planning to call in. She said she couldn't get in. And I think everybody here is signed in through a school email, which means we're not fully public. Mm. Even, even if they tried to call in, they couldn't call in with the PIN number? It's on the agenda? Oh, that I don't know about. Um, what I'll do is I'll post. I'll, I don't know why the Google Meet swoops. I just opened Google Meets twice. Um, let me just go to the um, agenda. And I accidentally shut it when I opened up the wrong thing. And I'll post a I'll post a number from the agenda. Welcome to Hangout. Enter the meeting followed by the Yeah, someone's doing it. Yeah, it's me. Oh. Thank you. You're muted because a lot of people are on this call. Press star six to unmute. This call is being recorded and streamed. Press star six. So it is. It looks like whatever's on the posting, it is possible to join by phone, but perhaps not by computer. Thank you. All right. So I guess if there is anyone on the, well, uh, yeah, it gives you instructions for how to unmute. So if there's anyone there joining us by phone who would like to unmute and make a comment. All right. No, unfortunate. I don't think we have anyone who's called in. It's everyone yeah. is on a computer right now from what it looks like. So um, Darius, what are you working on? I was just going to put it out there for Jessica so she could give it to the person. OK, did you find it? Because I can post it in the chat if needed. I oh, think it is on the school calendar item listing, if I remember correctly. <clears throat> yeah, I mean it's that's where it should be, and I'm I'm curious as to why the the virtual meeting is not um, open to both. So um, all right. Um, so it looks like we're not going to get any public comments. Uh, what about uh, school committee members? Anyone besides Peter? Maisie, Jessica? <coughs> yeah, what do you got, Keith? It's, so it sounds like what I'm hearing is, a, I, I anticipate that there will be cuts next year. What it sounds like is making cuts right now might be a little bit too early until we have more specific numbers. So. What it makes sense to me is voting this budget now as the budget we would like, and then having to make those adjustments as we get more solid numbers in later. 
Uh, that, that sounds like what we're all sort of coalescing around, right? Peter's points about the, the information coming in and uh, um, let's see. Now, I guess we're doing this slightly out of order. In that case, do we want to just go ahead and vote the budget? Do we entertain a motion for that as is, or do we? I think you need to close the meeting first. Close the hearing first. Close the hearing first. All right. Which you can just do. Uh, in that case, the hearing is closed. Thanks, everyone, who joined us. And uh, we'll proceed with the school committee meeting. Oh, actually, we just had someone join by phone. Who is muted, perhaps? Oh, I guess they didn't want to comment. All right. Uh, so the hearing is closed and on to the school committee meeting. Um, so are we back to the, the warrants? Yeah, I, I can certainly talk about the warrants. So um, first thing is I did share the uh, general fund and school choice expense reports electronically. So if there are questions, I'm happy to take questions about those. Um, but as far as warrants go, uh, I don't have warrants to present today. They're being worked on. Um, if we had had our joint meeting, we would have um, had them ready to present if we were in person. Um, but they're not due till the town until Tuesday. So Michelle is currently working to put everything together with all the appropriate people that present warrants to us. Um, we're looking at moving to an electronic signature for warrants. Um, we test, tested it out. Waitley was the first run today. Um, they had their virtual meeting last night and agreed to go ahead with Adobe Sign, which is a legal uh, form of electronic signature. Uh, we were up, able to upload all of the warrants and all of the bills directly into Adobe and then blast it out from, uh, it comes from me through Adobe Sign to the school committee. Um, and the other thing that I'm asking you all to do, like uh, Waitley did, and we'll be asking the other school committees as well, is to assign one person as um, the signature on warrants moving forward, at least while we're in this closure, so that we don't have to try to collect the three signatures every time that we have a warrant to run while we're out. It'll also help us during the summer months or if we have to cancel a meeting over the winter. I don't have to email you and ask three people to come in we can send the electronic signatures out and it would be available for everyone to review. You'll all get them. And if you want to sign them, you certainly can. But say, for example, um, Greg is voted as the one who's going to sign. All we would need is his one signature to go ahead and move it through the town versus having to wait for three people to sign it. Um, and that is, according to Mass General Law, we are legally allowed to do that. So I'd love to ask for your support in those two pieces of assigning one person as the um, reviewer and signer, and then um, moving to electronic moving forward. Outstanding. Is that something we have to vote or can we just agree to it? I would ask Darius legally if they have to vote on who is the signer, that piece you probably have to vote on. Um, the electronic signature piece, I, I think, is just an agreement. All right. You're muted, Darius. Sorry, I was not paying attention in class. I went and grabbed my wife's computer, who doesn't have a Frontier account, um, and she was able to join. Excellent. <laughs> so, all right, I got to shut that off. Oh, no, you're okay. But... So I just wanted to make sure that we weren't out of compliance for the, the public hearing section of this meeting. So I don't know what that person's problem was. At least there was not a, a wrong address for the Google Docs, which was my immediate concern that we'd have to repost another public hearing on this if it wasn't accurate. And that kind of proves that it, you, can, you can log in. Um, and maybe that person had some other issues. So regarding the, um, there's two things that's happening with, with the, the Google Doc signs. Um, the signing rather of the not the Google Docs, the doc, doc sign. Adobe sign. Adobe sign is that we can eventually go to a committee that signs solely that way. Until we get there, we're asking that we elect one person as we get through this kind of crisis period. Um, and then we're going to see how it, it works. And then in the future, um, uh, you know, Shelly was talking about this is how they did it in Chicopee, where she worked last. Um, all documents were done 
digitally. All committee members can review in, their, in the leisure of their of their homes, look through the documents, and then sign off on those in that way. So that's the uh, that's kind of the game plan here. So we're looking for one person kind of to get us through the next two months, and hopefully this crisis will be over even before then, um, just so that she can streamline stuff because we also have limited people in the office, limited number of support. So getting multiple signatures right now is is. is just, and on a positive note, there's not much expenses outside of salaries being going through the office as well. So, so Greg had asked, do they have to vote on one person being the authorized signer? Okay. Yes, uh, Greg, are you willing to do it? I'm. I'm certainly uh, around. You know, I'm around during the week all summer. So. Okay. Uh, so then, willing to do it, then I'll make a motion that we authorize Greg to sign warrants electronically on behalf of the committee, or or ink until the yeah yeah. Until the electronic okay. stuff is online. Well, a in favor? We need a second. Yeah, that was. That's uh, a second. So, procedure wise, I'm sorry, guys. I know it's a hassle, but online um, meetings, everything has to be a roll call. Yep. Okay. Maisie? Yes. Right. Maisie? Yes. 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 Yep. Keith? Yes. All right, Jessica? Yes. Peter? Yes. Greg? Yes. Thank you, sorry. Great, thank you for that. I very much appreciate it. So Greg, you'll get a message from me or you'll all get a message from me through Adobe Sign. Um, check your, it has, you have to check your Frontier email. I found out with Waitley today. It did not forward automatically must be some type of security piece that Adobe Sign has put in place. So you have to actually go into your Frontier email if you normally have your Frontier email forwarded and um, find the message, log in, and then I'll give you, you'll get a message with some details from me. And again, everyone can review, everyone can sign, um, but with Greg's, as soon as I have Greg's, I'll push it through to the town for payments. Great. Can I ask Shelly? Yep. I just want to clarify, maybe I missed it, because um, I'm trying to think about Frontier as well, but I just want to clarify that we're able to pay all of our, all the employees for Sun Home Elementary, most specifically the, the hourly ones, out of the revolving accounts and shuffling some school choice money, and it's going to keep us on solid, well, we will remain on solid financial footing towards the end, of, to the end of this year. Is that correct? Yeah, so we are paying everyone. Um, we 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 may have to move some funding around in some of those revolving accounts to make it happen, but all employees, including hourly employees, are still receiving compensation as long as school is closed. Okay, and and it it doesn't put us in a really really bad situation. No, I, I we have froze spending for FY twenty one. Um, so only essential purchases and payroll will be happening right now. You know, Ben and I can talk about those things or other administrators that need things, maintenance, for example. Um, but we're currently looking at every line item in the budget to see where we can capture some savings to help support the revolving funds that are most impacted by a tuition loss during the closure. Um, I expect that there will be some impact on FY21 because of this tuition loss to those revolving accounts. For this year, um, we're not not in a hardship in Sunderland currently in finances. It certainly is unfortunate to lose that revenue because we still have to continue to pay our staff, and that's going to make things tight. Um, but everyone will be paid, and and we have adequate funds to pay them. It just might be from a different funding source than what was planned. And one question for Darius. Thank you, Shelley. Sure. Um, have you heard anything from Commissioner Riley about use of the rainy day fund at all from the state? So, I mean, that wouldn't be his purview. That'll come from Governor Baker um, as he'll cover, as he'll decide whether or not to use that. And in fact, I'm not even sure if it takes an act of the legislature to release that money. Um, so I know I haven't heard anything from Riley regarding that. Um, okay. And I just, to be blunt, most of the information coming out of the state is two days late after every decision. Um, so it just seems to be that way. It's, it's, it's very frustrating. But um, 
as far as finances, the Department of Education doesn't do, doesn't really do the funding of the schools. So all the way through. So that's gonna be coming from the state legislature and they're gonna to have to decide how they're gonna prioritize emergency funds. You know, some of the early conversations. And so I've been catching tidbits of different things around the state and, you know, legislatures are obviously, they're gonna make sure that first responders and that kind of things are, are fully funded. But there is a, there, this is where the arguments begin is some believe that schools should be um, next in line to be funded to get this society up and running full speed again. And then there's going to be some that aren't going to say that, but aren't going to vote that. So it depends on, you know, again, there's a lot of money there um, that was promised with Student Opportunity Act. You got that to begin with. And then just, the, the, just how they're going to fund towns. Um, and there's even the, the one concern, the, just the, the scary concern. I'm not sure. I haven't heard any movement on it. I don't know if Peter has as well, but is whether or not they're going to do any fourth quarter adjustments because of the revenue loss of this year. Um, I don't think nobody wants to do that, but you know the governor could do some some change in payments in the fourth quarter. I think that would really screw things up. But it's you know I know it was being discussed at one point. Thank you. All right, um, just going by numbers, and I know we the public hearing is over. I, I'm hitting the uh, the line item that's public comment. I don't know if anyone joined us late or. Uh, Correct. I mean, the public comment on this is now public comment to anything else that's on the agenda that wasn't exactly. related to the budget. Not just, <laughs> but not I guess just, we'll take either yeah. if you came on late, right? Yeah, it, it, exactly. So the, the floor is open again uh, for anything, including the school budget, but not limited to. Um, hey, Greg. Go ahead. I, I'll use this public comment. Uh, just, Me I want to. I just want to make sure that you know, just a shout out to all the teachers and staff and everyone in the administration who's been working so hard to deal with this situation um, and, and keep, you know, keep a lot of education going on with all the kids at home and getting meals out and all that. And it's easy to um, forget about it, you know, but every day they're doing it. And I just want to make sure they understood that how, how much that is appreciated. And you know, we're a small town and, and boy, it makes a big difference in the town that the school is continuing to function so well, okay, under this uh, uh, time of crisis. And uh, what I hear uh, sitting in on selectman meetings uh, is a whole lot of positive stuff about uh, things that the school are doing. And so, again, just a thank you to all you that are doing that. Thank you, Peter. I, I was actually going to use the public comment for the exact same thing. Um, we're in a situation where you know it's sort of it would be natural to say thank you because it is so very hard. But I, I got to say, if you're not involved in the schools, um, I am blown away what this district has done. They've been ahead of the pack, you know, from top to bottom, from the administration, the food service, everyone. I mean, it's the kids are getting materials at home um, way ahead of what's been coming out from the state. So. Uh, Definitely appreciate and value the the school system we have here. I'd like to echo that in one more specific area, which is that I, I work in a in another district, and I felt like Union Thirty Eight Frontier has really um, been confronting the equity issues in the school closure with the with the food and the technology and all sorts of things. Um, so they this this district has really been shining in my eyes through this experience. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, and I just want to add, I, there's, there's, I've got a, a friend who's a teacher at the school, and she sent me an email a couple of days ago, and she said, when, when Ben told us to do four hours of teaching and learning every day, I wondered how I would do that. Now I wonder how not to do 10 hours a day, because she's got so much going on. She says, but yes, I do hope we're back in school in May. I miss the interactions with kids and with my colleagues. Again, boy, we got some great people working in this school. For sure. It, I, I want to throw my compliments out there, but I, I want Ben to give his report on what they're all doing and then save my comments to that point, because I think when he kind of brings you know to life what the, what the commitment has done, what we've done as a district, um, I'm going to save it for when Ben talks a little bit about what, what's rolling out there. I know we did it in a joint meeting, but 
um, just so you can ask individual questions about how things are rolling out, because um, it is still an evolutionary. I mean, this week is a, is a whole new week because we rolled out something a little bit differently, and we're trying to make sure that no you know sto stone goes unturned or student goes on unwatched. So, um, and Ben, you're gonna probably talk about that, I imagine, in a little bit. Um, but you know, I'm gonna save my confidence that point. All right. Anyone else? All right. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, unfinished business. Uh, further discussion on the proposed uh, FY21 budget. Anyone want to say anything more on that before we move on? Nope. Okay. Um, let's see. Discussion Greg, and vote on the policies. Sorry? Greg, can I make a motion that we yes. approve the uh, proposed uh, FY21 budget? I think we need a motion and a vote. Yes, we do. Uh, and uh, second? I'll second it. Uh, all in favor? I guess we got a roll call. Peter? Yes. Keith? Yes. Yes. Maisie? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Greg? Yes. So that's five zero, right? Five zero. All right. Just try to keep minutes here, too. So, uh, discussion and vote on the following policies uh, JBB Educational Equity, um, JB uh, Equal Education Opportunities, JFABD Homeless Students Enrollment Rights <coughs> Compliance, uh, JFABE Educational Opportunities for Military Children, uh, and JFABF. Educational opportunities for children in foster care. So, in a nutshell, you can vote these as a block. The other committees did such. Um, these these policies again. Um, it's been a while since we talked about them, but it's it's really just to make sure that we don't that no student is harmed by their situation coming into our district, um, whether or not they be transplanted brought by due to military service, transplanted due to homelessness, or um, being part of the foster system. You know, basically that we make sure that our policies um, get the students where they are and they don't get punished for where they're from. Um, you can see it, especially could happen in the secondary. I think I explained this at the last meeting, but you could move, be moved from one school to another, not have enough credits to graduate, had no control over that, and then be basically punished by your home situation. And so this is just making sure that there's no, and also, also no boundaries in getting those students enrolled and educated as quickly as possible. Um, within it. So th that's kind of the general idea of all those policies. So Greg, can I make a motion? We approve all five of those with, at the same time. Greg seems to have left the meeting. I'm, just, I'm sure it was an accident. Uh, Jessica, you've been called into power. Right. <laughs> POTUS has gone down. <laughs> Did you kick him off, Jessica? No. Would somebody like to move to approve these? We still have a quorum. Yeah, yeah. I'll second. Would like to move to approve the five policies named. So I made a motion. Who seconded? Keith? Keith. All right. Um, Greg's back. Greg's here just in time to take the roll call. <laughs> So Greg, we've uh, moved and seconded to approve these five policies. Unmute yourself, Greg, and then the roll call. Greg, you're muted. It's a good future to have when you roll when you get online. <laughs> there we go. I have, I have two mute buttons. Sorry. Uh, yeah, Jessica. Yes. Peter? Yes. Keith? Yes. Maisie? Yes. And Greg, yes. Five oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. And uh, new business uh, school choice recommendations. Pass that to Ben. Hi everyone. Uh, good evening. So you should have received the school choice recommendations um, for the 
2021 school year, um, you'll notice that the highest number is in kindergarten, and that which is typically the case. Um, right now, we have 16 kindergarten in town residents who have registered for kindergarten, and another three additional um, school choice students who have registered, um, who have siblings in the upper grades, um, with the projected class size right now of of 19. Uh, if you recall around this time last year, we were around the same number. And uh, what we found over the years is that um, through the end of the school year and over the summer, we have, um, we have additional students register for kindergarten. Um, so we're still looking like it will be two classes for next year as well. And then all of the other grade levels either have one opening or um, two openings, um, as uh, shown in the document that I provided you. Um, the, the change in past years is that um, for some grade levels where we were um, due to need or the size of the, the enrollment at that grade level, we were not in, uh, recommending any openings. But this year, um, we need to have at least one opening, um, and that's for students who potentially are moving, uh, current Sunderland residents who are moving out of town. Uh, do you have any questions on that? Yeah, hey, Ken. Um, obviously, the other thing that we don't know at this point is what sort of uh, you know new students we may be getting from the new development on U116. And so I assume that you've you know left it, left some wiggle room here for so that you know assuming that they are spread out over the grades that we can then handle it. that and also knowing that you know there's a very good chance we're going to be out for the remainder of the year and our current students um are going to need all the attention um that our teaching staff can can provide them to catch them up right uh ben just to check i got one um recommendation on April 3 going recommended openings was like four four one 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 three and then I got another one on April 6 that going down was one two one 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 two Just yeah, wondering if the, the one on the four six is the is the correct one that's the updated yeah. version You need. You don't need a vote. Oh, you do need a vote on that, don't you? Yeah. And you're yeah. you're not voting per grade level. You're just voting whether or not uh, the school will be participating in accepting students for school choice. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Uh, move to approve the school choice recommendations. Second. Is that you, Jessica? Is seconded? Yes. Thank you. Peter? Uh, yes. Let's see us. Maisie? Yes. Keith? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Greg? Yes. 5 0. All right. Uh, Capital projects. Um, there's, I, I can give you the following update, Greg. Um, number one, the selectmen, obviously everything is yeah. running at a later schedule than usual because town meeting having been put off. Um, the selectmen have uh, got a draft warrant uh, and there is an article on there uh, to uh, have uh, capital you know, a list of capital projects like we've done the last several years. Um, but the actual projects have not been specified. However, there's now scheduled for next Tuesday evening, a meeting of the Capital Planning Committee, uh, which I plan to attend. I assume it'll be a virtual meeting. Um, and so um, hopefully there will be some progress at that point about uh, picking out, again, what specific projects we might want to do. I think there's a recognition 
uh, among the leadership in the town that uh, you have to keep uh, paying attention to your capital stuff as well as your operating budgets because uh, if you don't, that's how you get in trouble. So um, it's just that the progress on this is coming a little later than it would under a normal year. So I'll keep you posted as stuff uh, happens there. And since it will be a while between then and our next meeting, what I'll probably do is send out an email to the committee uh, just with information, not for discussion, just to keep you all posted. Um, and I think that's perfectly okay under the open meeting laws. So okay. that's, that's the plan anyway, and we'll see what transpires. And it may be that, you know, I'll need to get Ben or Darius to, to come you know, to be part of that virtual meeting in order to make sure that we uh, speak up for what the school wants to do. Outstanding. Uh, any other uh, committee? I, everything's up in the air now, but I assume no other uh, committees have met or the collaborative or anything like that? Hey, we skipped over the first reading of a new set of five, poli five new policies. Ooh, you're good catch. Let's go to that. <clears throat> So I have a concern about the public comment policy, which is that it doesn't allow for an exception to let public comment last more than 15 minutes. And I think that we recently had circumstances with a huge turnout for public comment, that it was really important that we heard everybody out um, for the sake of our community, for the sake of negotiations. Um, and I would really like to see if we can add an exception, you know, at, um, you know, that could be granted by the chair of the committee so that we don't firmly have to cut off after 15 minutes. So um, that particular um, kind of going through all of them, I'll, let me go through all of them so we can get the other ones behind us. The, the other ones are basically, um, these are again, are all policies recommended by MASC. Um, the first four are basically um, are asked to be removed because they are covered either under mass general law or I think all of them are covered under Mass General Law. I may be straight with you, um, or another under another policy. But so the basic instructional program is under Mass General Law, under core, um, under the core curriculums. Uh, student insurance program is no longer Mass um, Insurance is, is taking that over. The guidance program is no longer relevant, even though there is guidance programs that exist. Um, and student gifts and solicitation is under is is a law now under the ethics law. Um, the public comment one is is the one that is gotten the most conversation around school committees because um, if you go through it it's most complicated too because it, it goes through it the red is the changes there that they recommended adding the cross out is what they're adding the cross out and what was what's in black is what was the original policy um, I did reach out to school council because uh, Frontier had a problem with they want to be able to waive it um, because at, they want to be able to waive it at the chair because sometimes you only have one or two people you have a you know you have more commonly than not, either a, either a teacher's there to just add one little comment on something or a select board member's there. And we, we, we like to have that kind of free flow conversation um, and they want to be able to waive it. So I brought it to uh, Adam Dupree, our attorney. He's looking it over. He doesn't like um, what Jessica brought up. He doesn't like the um, other wording and he wants to contact MASC to understand their, their logic under that portion of it. Um, so he's going to give us a different version to look at again. So I was going to make that comment when that came forward, but I had that conversation with him. Was it this week or last week? Um, amongst you know, all the other stuff, because I was asking him about changing the language, um, to create an exception, um, around those rules. And so, um, he, I think he did when he talked to me also commented 15 minutes, sometimes you can go over, you know, it says you can go over the three minute mark, but not the 15 minute mark. And that should be at the discretion of the committee. So. We'll get those changes in there. So I think there'll be another reading before that. Goes yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. But that's coming. The changes on that. Some people are wondering the timing of that. You know, we've had some very public meetings or with more participants in than recently, than in past years. It has nothing to do with that. This has to actually come out of a case, I believe, at a Worcester where there was some people that were hijacking meetings, um, and not letting the school committee commit business, and so they they try to change the law because they challenged the the policy or whatnot. So that's where that's coming out of. So that's not not a reaction to um, one would think one equals one, but that's not well, one equals the other, but that's not the case here. So we'll get better clarification and get a policy that we all can digest. 
Okay. So there's no action. You're just talking about them. Any other comments on other policies? All right, then uh, the principal's report. Ben? No, Ben. No. We, we lost can't read lips. So I assume your closed caption isn't on either then. There we go. Um, yeah, we should be able to hear now. Um, upon the closure of school, our primary task was to make sure students still had access to our school lunch and breakfast programs. Our school food service director, Mary DeLusa, helped to organize volunteers from across the district to deliver food um, to households. Uh, families who chose to participate in this program also had the option of picking up their meals at their respective schools. Um, starting this week, um, this past Monday, our food service program was running on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. Um, and that would uh, provide uh, lunch and then breakfast and lunch for the following um, following day. So the, the off days of Tuesday and Thursday, Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, students were still being fed uh, during those times as well. Um, the other point which Jessica spoke to as well was our device loan program. Uh, currently uh, throughout across all grade levels, we've loaned out from Sunderland Elementary School approximately 55 devices, which includes iPads and Chromebooks. Um, and, you know, with this remote learning platform, those those devices are needed uh, in every student's hands to make it as equitable as possible. In regards to the remote learning, um, based on guidance from DESE, we developed a remote learning plan for our faculty and staff. Um, initially, we used Monday and Tuesday as planning days, and then this is uh, the first week of school closure, and then rolled it out to our staff on, on that Wednesday. Um, our Director of Curriculum and Instruction, Kim McCarthy, played really played an instrumental and lead role in making this happen. Um, our connections through learning plan has helped to guide teachers in developing weekly learning plans, uh, forming teaching teams, ident identifying procedures for supporting our vulnerable students and families, and also has provided our teaching team with guidance for uh, student and family contact. Now, what does the remote learning look like in action? Well, first off, the work of the Sunderland Elementary School faculty and staff has been nothing short of absolutely incredible. They've risen to the occasion, which is really to no one's surprise. Surprise! Uh, they've supported our students in so many different ways. The learning platform at Sunderland Elementary School features Google Sites and Google Classroom, links to online learning programs, whole class, small group, and individual connections through Google Meet, and access to differentiated content so that all students can experience success. Our teachers have contacted families through text messages, late night calls, early morning calls, Google Meets over the weekend, any and, any and all that you can think of, um, they have done. Uh, they've attended professional development se seminars. And really, in order to make this remote learning uh, happen, I, I, I would be remiss if I did not mention our technology department. Um, it's a group of a few professionals, but they really absolutely came through and provided training for this new form of, of learning. So really, all the way around, it was one huge collaborative effort. No excuses were made. Everyone put their best foot forward and really just, you know, made this kind of tough situation pretty incredible for, for our families. We still have a lot of work to do, um, but I don't want to, um, you know, leave this without just recognizing the amazing teaching staff of, of Sunderland who, you know, time and time again, just completely show their true colors. So I'm so appreciative of their efforts. And I know that the students and families feel the warmth and love. Ben, you were supposed to kind of give the outline, and I was supposed to give the, the big compliment. That's going to be tough to beat, that, that compliment. But I really, a couple of things I want to highlight is that it's the individual support that we're doing that other districts are not doing um, at, or are trying to catch up in doing. The fact that we reached out in that first week or two to almost every family, um, that connection. Um, the fact that we did a parent forum online and teachers attended those forums to help give advice 
Um, I, I see I see uh, Vicki Palmer on there. Remember you, you speaking and kind of giving just look, talking about the whole child and the whole family. That it wasn't just about your kid and whether or not they're learning math. It's how are you doing and how's the family doing and how can we you know, we really became the glue for the entire community. And I think that is what's setting our program um, kind of the next next the next notch higher and everybody kind of stepping up and knowing that it's not going to be perfect and that we're going to have to adjust it along the way. Um, that attitude that that can do attitude with that is a uh, I just wanted to kind of highlight that as well. That it's just been very amazing. The, the amount of hard work um, has been exhausting. Um, I've seen it, you know, I haven't seen it directly to the teachers, but I mean, hearing about it because the principals are talking to me about what the, princ the, the teachers are all they're doing, and um, it's just been amazing. And so, just thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, really, it's coming from us, but I'm hearing it from the parents. I'm hearing how thankful they are that they're not alone, um, that they're being supported. And it's not just like, again, the X's and O's of a math problem, but the, the whole child and the whole family. So, thank you. Darius, do you want to say anything about MCAS and the status of that? Do I want to say anything about MCAS? What a great test. Um, no. Um, the uh, So right now, according to, the, 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 uh, according to uh, Riley, the commissioner, we have approval from the federal government to not give the test. Apparently, um, someone's doing the dishes. Um, apparently, um, we the Massachusetts has another loophole it has to jump through. It has to file special legislation to give Commissioner Riley the ability to either change the test or cancel the test. And in that language, I know there's been some communication out to the MCA about concern that the um, the test may be still be coming. I would be very much surprised. I'm not going to make any decision. Commissioner Riley is, but he's really from the beginning kind of talked about putting the test aside. That shouldn't be a priority. Um, I don't know where the politics are happening on that in the state, but um, most of the other states have gone off the federal um, the, the, the federal government giving them leeway not to give the test this year. So I think it's just a matter of getting the X's and O's in place. So um, I'd be very surprised if we're giving that test in any capacity this year. Hey Jan, yeah. does this stop the smashing around? I can hear it on the. Yeah, Jan. Yeah, Jan. <laughs> uh, Greg, I don't have a. A superintendent's report it's kind of all the other stuff that's been going on so um going down the agenda looks um, like keith had his hand up maybe with a question yeah just a couple of points um so one to echo what both ben and darius said about the, the amount of of work the teachers have put in you know so i you know as others here are involved in this my wife's involved in it it's been really hard uh, it's basically learning things on the fly and trying to implement them within about five minutes of learning it. Um, there's been very little separation between home and work now. I find I'm checking email, online, uh, Google Classroom, every night, all day long, beyond kind of what's been requested. Uh, so it's been uh, it's been very hard, but uh, the teachers, both in my district and from what I've seen from my my kids at Frontier and what I'm hearing at Sunderland, it's been a lot of hard work, and it's it's been really really impressive what the teachers have all done. Um, some other things to think about. On the other hand, one of the things that the MTA has kind of come out with is a recommendation against um, uh, video learning. Uh, I don't know where I stand on this honestly because I do uh, have some online office hours, but. They're recommending that online learning be teacher generated, not teacher delivered. Teachers uh, can provide the content, but don't necessarily deliver it. There's some uh, legal ramifications as mandated reporters if you're seeing into the home and there's privacy elements. Um, and then there's the recording of it. You don't know what a child can do. So there's some there's some area we have to be concerned about as well. Um, so I just want to balance. Uh, the great work is being done with also some other ideas that are out there as well. You're muted again, Greg. A any reaction to that or comment on, on that concern? Is that something you guys had on your radar? 
So, yeah, we, we've discussed a lot of those things. Um, you know, the, you're reading the news about Zoom bombing and stuff. That's why we're not, you know, at one point we were trying to get Zoom and we put the, the brakes on that. Um, Google, um, you know, Google Meet has upped its capacities and, and, and has increased its uh, abilities there. Um, I kind of keep it, I'll give you my philosophy of it is that I'm trying, we're in a very difficult time where it takes kind of the community to pull it together. And um, I'm trying not to put the barriers in place without the solution. And a lot of districts are getting caught with the barriers um, within those kind of things. Um, you know, again, you know, the online learning thing, it depends on how you deliver it. Our teachers are providing a full list. Some of them are just doing meetings and meeting with the students as part of the social emotional. Some are doing a little bit more with lesson, lesson teaching and stuff. It, you know, it depends on the grade. Um, some are providing activities for the kids to do with the parents and then kind of report back those activities. So we're, it's kind of a whole smorgasbord. Um, and again, my kind of the, my philosophy on that is that there is some there is some legal concerns. We talk about 51 A's and people seeing inside of homes. You know, I did send out a, a, a notice to parents that basically to kind of give the, the general review that they're you know, when someone student goes does go online that there is expectations. Um, the other side is is if a teacher does see it, they are a mandated reporter. And I know it puts them in an uncomfortable position, but I would not want to close my eyes to not see what's going on in that room if something terrible is happening in that room. So it, it's kind of a, unfortunately, it, it makes give me goosebumps saying that. But it, it, unfortunately, we have that kind of balance of where we're trying to reach out and be supportive families. Um, and we do, you know, we're asking a little bit more of people and we've, um, you know, we're going to support teachers, if, you know, through that, if, if, there, if there becomes a necessary that we have to let some authority know of a, a, a concerning thing, um, that the administration's there to support teachers through that so they don't have to do that alone. Um, so it kind of for each one, it's, that's kind of how I felt kind of from the beginning is doing it. As we, with each obstacle, let's find the solution to that obstacle and try to keep learning moving forward um, rather than being, and I don't mean to call it being scared, but I, because I do know the scary things that can happen. Um, we are a smaller district. We do know our families a little bit better than some of these, you know, um, districts that are larger than our county. Um, so, you know, it's, I kind of take where we are at, looking at where, what we're able to do, taking the teacher's knowledge of their own kids in their own classrooms and applying that and helping them as well. So. I hope I kind of answered that question. So we're, I'm seeing it. I don't have the answers to every, you know, those kind of things, but that's been my philosophy. Yeah, Darius, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. Um, I agree with almost everything what you're saying. Um, I, I think they're doing, everybody's doing great work. There's no, um, we got nothing that's happened before that we can really base what we're doing off of. We're trying to figure out who's going along. And I think you're right, where the, the teachers do know their students best, they really, they can decide what they're doing. But I think, um, I just wanted to make sure that everything was out there and that I, I would be remiss if we didn't, if I didn't just, you know, all the ramifications that we're dealing with. I think you brought up the one, the one question that hasn't come out yet is, um, you know, the school vacation week and, you know, the, right now we, we, it was discussed at the frontier meeting today and they did a poll um, whether or not they should have school, whether or not school vacation week should change. Um, it's not something I would, I was looking to change, but I, you know, we're looking to get general feedback from teachers. I think our teachers, what I'm hearing right now, but I'm waiting to, I spoke with the union leaders today, um, is if they want it to change, it really should come from the teachers. But I think our teachers started running out of the gates um, and this break may be more important to catch their breath than looking at the June time. Um, we are also a district that didn't have many snow days, whether good or bad, no, no comments there. Um, so we actually are finishing, um, you know, we're finishing on the 18th where many of the other districts are finishing well into the 20s because they had uh, different decisions around snow days. So, um, you know, so now they're, whether or not they kind of won that deal this year, but, um, you know, whether or not we have to, you know, shorten the summer, the, the, the June eight isn't as a concern, I think, as some other districts are seeing. So anyways, that's where we are on school vacation week. That is a school committee decision. Right now, um, administratively, there's no reason to really change it. I'm not strong one way or the other, but I did reach out to teachers and if they are very strong and the vast majority of them want to, want to switch those dates out to June to April, we'd be, I'd say, I told them I would take that to school committee for discussion, but um, right now we don't have that request formally. And I'm not sure we'll get it. 
be honest with you. <clears throat> All right. Any other comments? Hey, Hi. Go ahead, Peter. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, I was just going to say that we've had Scott Bergeron, who's chair of the select board, sitting in on a good bit of this meeting, and I didn't know if he wanted to say anything about just, you know, all this and what's going on, and he must know what's going to happen down the road, so maybe he could he could inform us. Hey, Scott. Scott. Um, hey, Peter. Hey, everybody. I appreciate uh, being able to plug into the meeting. It's, um, it's certainly an interesting time where we can sit across, you know, our dining room tables and, you know, talk about school policy. That said, um, I'm sure you guys, I was late in getting involved, talked about the, the budget early on. Um, I'm equally intrigued about the learning, and that's a huge cat. Nice job. Um, uh, I'm equally interested in, in understanding what, if any, steps the administration is taking about this uh, distance learning thing. I got no horses in the race. I see the texts come up from staff saying, great job advocating for teacher positions, which I've done for 25 years now in all of my time. But we're in a different space and I hope that there's some exam in the future about what potential or what good came from or what opportunity came from uh, this particular uh, response. So that said, I'll leave that on the table. Uh, secondly, I would say from the town's perspective, we're uh, clearly concerned about available uh, revenues to the town and that is in the form of a variety of places that's in the form of uh, sales taxes and places that are closed down uh, restaurant and meals hotel and meals that are closed down that's in the state's response even today uh, the governor uh, moving 800 million dollars of existing funds to support hospitals which we should all do um, we are uh, living in a space right now where the um, current revenue pie, if you will, um, is being diverted. And we have to be uh, cognizant of that. And in that cognizant sense, we have to recognize that our ask going forward probably is going to be impacted. And that's impacted at both a local and a state and a federal level. That's not to say we have to, it's not to say that we have to, you know, go draconian at this point. But our, our guidance right now from the town office building is between three and 5% of the original expense growth ask going forward. And we're hoping, fingers crossed, all of them, uh, that we're not going to have uh, a deeper ask than that. With respect to capital, and Peter mentioned that earlier, just as I plugged in, and uh, we have our warrant articles uh, in place and on the warrant. So the warrant article for Frontier is such that, you know, we're ready to go. Uh, but that warrant stays open until 14-ish days before the annual town meeting, which is now June 6th. And I'm sorry, annual town meeting is June 5th with the election June 6th. And it's important to bear in mind that there's a fair amount of uh, dynamics between now and then. Yeah. And again, that's the entirety of the town, not just the school. The school plays, the elementary school, Frontier, and uh, Franklin Tech play ne nearly 70% basically 70% between all of the inputs and outputs of the town's operating budget. So that said, uh, we'll be uh, clear and clear minded and honest about what those um, asks are and uh, appreciate uh, all of the efforts that Sunderland Elementary as well as Frontier and uh, Franklin Tech have done uh, but we have to be ready for June. So 
I yep. appreciate the opportunity to talk. And it was a public comment period. These uh, video meetings are interesting, uh, and it's kind of hard as a chair to kind of you know, operate the radar of the room. So I appreciate being called on. Thank you, Scott. Um, and just to catch you up uh, and, and maybe you know reiterate some of where we're at, um, we understand that there are mathematical realities. Uh, I don't envy what the select board has to do. I understand more, the more I get involved in this, uh, the the harder I understand how what you're trying to do is. Uh, I can't wait to the school committee. Yeah, there's there's so much uncertainty uh, going forward. And so uh, we're kind of taking the same position of, we'll see as we get closer. But one thing that I'm definitely hearing from the administration is, it's easier to figure out how to deal with a target number than to create a range of options. There are so many permutations so that as we get down to the wire, it may be helpful to try to dial in, is it three, is it five, like where exactly the number falls? Because that's, uh, these are hard choices and trying to, to juggle lots of, of permutations is, uh, is a lot of work. That, that's a really good way to put it. And from our uh, office, either through, through Peter or through directly, uh, direct contact to the superintendent, uh, we'll make sure that as clean and clear as the information we have is, uh, so does uh, the school committee. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. I think I think Greg kind of just said it. The idea that you know the difference between three and four percent, you know, thirty thousand dollars changes how you approach it. You know, what I mean, it's not just a one less tool that you're buying for the toolbox. You you change the way you're going to approach the tool. You're going to way you're going to approach the project rather than looking at the tools in the toolbox. So that's why you know it's better if we have a. I think we're going to we're going to wait and kind of see where the the funding comes to see what the state does, see how it's going to address education because as we know there's a larger ripple effect. We talked about it a little bit earlier about how um, how they if they're going to they're going to attack one set of money and how that's going to have to be backfilled with another set of money and and then the ripple effect of, in in trying to figure that all out. Um, we you know we're going to do a little bit of waiting and seeing. Um, um, because even in the ch even in the additions of our new budget this year, there are some things that are are not negotiable, meaning that you know that we're either required to do them or you no, know, that we're required to you know pay for them. I use trash as an example. You know, we have a new trash bill. That's the bill. You know, so we can't all of a sudden not have trash. So um, so you know, if we have to do reductions that are larger than that, then we actually have to go back to it. It's not just what our increase was. You know, some of those things in our increase are aren't choices; they're they're mandates, so to speak. So, yeah. And, anyway, I'm trying to repeat myself over from what we were talking about earlier, but I think you understand that. No, that's, that's a really good point. A really good point, Darius. And I think the important part of that is to recognize that the the town and the Sunderland Elementary and its support uh, to the district, you know, is has been demonstrated over time, and we'll continue to do that. But we have to be creative in difficult times. Lord knows we've done it in the past. <laughs> we'll yeah. do it again. All right. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Greg, are we ready for a motion to adjourn? I think so. I'll make that motion. Second. Hold on, the agenda says executive session. <laughs> yeah, it does. And I, I, I floated that earlier. Um, do I mean, uh, I guess we so can basically, Roman. basically, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I put that on the agenda throughout negotiations so that if anything changes comes up because we're in negotiations, you may want to talk about negotiations at any meeting. So that will continue to be on there as long as we're in negotiations. Um, there hasn't been any movement since the kind of the crisis hit in negotiation so i have no really new no information to report um it is another factor that's going to fit into all this this uh crisis we're in um because we do you know our, our contract does expire um with the teachers on june 30th so um trying to project that out amidst all of this is just another headache um could i ask what i'm sorry in here I said, could I ask a question about that? 
Is, is there an opportunity in the negotiations to continue simply as the contract exists and negotiate forward? I get there's some areas that are date sensitive. We, we're in this position as well with other uh, negotiating parties and those negotiating parties have said, yeah, we get it. We understand. Let's just continue with the current contract negotiation, the current contract language and move forward set a date certain yeah so so basically by our the way the contract works now is by basically by the the laws of the contract is that we continue to operate under the old contract until a new contract is um awarded Got or, it. Or agreed upon um so um you know, we were in that position halfway through this year where we were running off the old contracts teachers would receive their steps um but however, there would be no coal adjustment as that's the, that's the other part, but we run off the language of the old contract. Correct. Um, and that's what, that's what, that's what we did, had to do this year um, until we settled upon a one year contract. And um, if we don't, we don't formalize some sort of agreement prior to the 30th, we will be doing the same thing as we work on the next contract. So some MOU and then move forward. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it'll be interesting. I think, I think everybody's waiting to see what the other, with the, hopefully the brush of fresh air that will come out if we get through the, the worst few weeks of this and see what the economics are. And then, um, you know, there'll be some, you know, what are we going to do? Or, you know, in the sense of talking about overall within negotiations, is it best to look at another one year given the economic turmoil or try to figure out what we do over three years? You know, so that would be something, again, that's a contractual, that's a negotiation thing. Both sides would have to be talking about it. But that's what's kind of entering my mind. It's very difficult to project out given the current, um, so it's just like we can't do our own budget. <laughs> How can right. you do three years of whatever? So, <clears throat> if I could, if I could, Mr. Chair, weigh in again. That th those those realities. It's important to bear in mind from a municipal a budgeting perspective. And you guys are in municipal budgeting. Totally understand it. The impact you have. Uh, there is not just the current year as we end the uncertainty of the future year. But the reality is that we live in an 18 month budget cycle, right? That just we are negotiating multi year contracts based on an 18 year, I'm sorry, an 18 month revenue cycle. And in this cycle here, who knows what's going to happen come July 1st? I, I applaud the current administration uh, and their approach toward leniency for things like postponing town meeting, having budgets go past July 1st. I mean, if you think about it, this is the first time in my 20 years now having a, an annual budget cycle that's based on a monthly expenditure report. That, that's that's jaw-dropping in from years past, and that's what we're being allowed. So we hope, we hope that this cleans up and clears out going into July 1st or immediately thereafter, but that's that's the kind of thing that negotiations have to have in the mix. Thank you, Scott. And I, and I know it's not easy. I totally yeah, yeah. get it. Outstanding. All right. Thanks so much, right. Mr. Chair. Certainly. Um, any reaction on that, or shall we? Uh, I, I think there was a motion to adjourn. Hello? Someone second that. I uh, think the motion to adjourn. Second? Yeah. Second. All right. All right. Maisie? Yes. Jessica? Yep. Peter? Yes. Keith? Yes. Greg? Yes. Thank you all so much.